You're listening to the Getting Salty Experience Podcast. Hey, there. Chief. How are you, Chief? How's the ankle? Oh, uh, feeling much better, thanks. Got my white... Oh, that's not white socks. That's a cast on my foot. Oh! Not with all your teeth. Well, my tooth. You problem with dentures? Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of the Getting Salty Experience podcast. It's the only one that brings the firehouse kitchen table to you. <laughs> you. What's that... <laughs> You, it's not really you know, all right. Enough. <laughs> <laughs> that couldn't have been comfortable. Oh. Oh my God. Funny, all right, we're back. We're Shum. back for another episode. Yep, I would like to say it's the only one that well, we're the really ones that only brings the firehouse kitchen table. There's a lot of guys who are saying it, and all of a sudden, Ruffy finds them all over the place. I actually, named the kitchen table podcast, they do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. And Ruffy writes him a little uh, note. No, oh, I haven't. Geez. Half of those guys, I didn't write anything. Yeah, everyone, but the, some, everyone, of them, some of them you wrote, like, uh, what'd you write? Oh, great idea. I wish, we would have thought I, wish of it. I would have thought of that. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, we should, hey, there should be a million yeah. ah, house, kitchen table. I, I, I love it. Yeah. yeah. No yeah. Let, the, let the chips fall where they may. Let the best oh, be okay. the best. And that's that. Yeah. My name's Chuck. I don't really give up. You know what? Oh, well, there we go. Always, we're back. We got Ruffy Ruff with his little Bupalini right there. I got the Bupalini back, baby. <laughs> What'd you shoot today? You went golfing today. I didn't today. shoot good today. 87. It was windy as a bitch 87. today. 87. Wow. Hmm. You know, I don't want to hear from him all day. I'm like, he's either playing golf or he's out with his cousin Yodice <laughs> or something. I, I know that. Drinking. Nice. I usually do call, I usually call him a few times in the yeah. morning. I do call I'm like, him. Oh, he's playing golf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there's Petey Pete's. We got little lights back there. Now you got your surfboard. You got your skateboards back there now too. Oh, gotta gotta have the skateboard so I could uh, wow. you know, get awesome. everybody get everybody psyched with all it's the sweatshirts. Cool a little better. I don't yeah. know what it is. It's How's like it doing? Burger King How's it doing with the uh, in laws back in there? It's freaking awesome. Yeah, everyone's yeah, good, awesome. man. Yeah, everyone's chilled out. Everyone's good. We're all kind of used to each other now. Yeah. And uh, what'd you have for dinner the, tonight? A little uh, brisket. Tonight I had a little I brisket. Uh, I had a little brisket. <laughs> 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 yeah, that was all like last weekend on Passover. We had the gefilte. <laughs> Did you have the gefilte? Actually, I didn't. I, I passed on the gefilte <laughs> every time. But we what? actually had a good one. Yeah, we, me and Felicia did most of the cooking, and there was there was bacon involved. So that's the kind of we put the what? ish. In, that's yeah, not really Jewish. Yeah, we put the ish in Jewish over here. You know what I mean? Wow. So all right, there it is. Pork. That's cool. Well, we got a very interesting show for you tonight. Um, oh looking, yeah. Uh, we actually were learning a lot as we were researching this. So I'm like, holy shit! We told you we were going to have the blitz. But before we get to Blitz, Pete, why don't you blitz him with a little advertisement, fella? Oh, I like the segue. Yeah. That was right. as smooth yes. as possible can be. Yeah. And let me tell you, yeah. nothing could be smoother than drinking your drink out of a beautiful cold tumbler from yeah. GettingSaltyApparel.com. Yeah. This is just one of our lovely accessories here. <laughs> uh, and, uh, of oh. course, you guys can find all the coolest firefighter accessories and apparel in the game here we got lighters we got cigar cutters we got all kinds of wonderful things and when you shop at gettingsaltyapparel.com for your favorite firefighter or friend uh you will also be supporting us at the show so thank you guys gettingsaltyapparel.com beautiful, beautiful. Oh. so you didn't think we were going to handle this by ourselves right hell no we needed somebody we needed a wanker from across the pond bro so we <laughs> went fishing across the bloody pond and we go to self oh, a no, wanker hello, hello. <laughs> No, I'm not even going to attempt doing that. I, I would All try right. the Austin Powers before you did the Cockney. Man. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I can do a good Irish. Right? I saw we got a guy, Irish guy in here. Yeah, baby. Yeah, yeah. baby. Fireisland.com. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Fire. Island. Yep. All right. So let's bring him in here. Let's bring a guy who was in the real fire brigade. All right, Nigel. Oh, <laughs> <man>. <laughs> hey, I'm only kidding Nigel. with you. I'm only kidding, Nigel. Nice with Nigel. Oh, Come on, I love man. Nigel. Nigel actually no, fed me 99% of all his information. He's awesome. I love yeah, him. Yeah, man. Nigel's great. All right, let's bring in our dude because he's, he's a real dude. It's Steve Dude. Dude. There he is. Oh, there there he is. Steve, dude. Yeah. yeah. Shalom. What an awesome introduction from a set of wankers, if ever I saw it. <laughs> 
<laughs> if I ever saw Wanka. What? Uh, uh, so let's, I asked you before. That's not your real name, right? What is your real name again? Do Steve like? Dudeny. Dudeny? Yeah. D U D E N E Y. Just put an N E Y on Steve Dude and you're good. Right. So they call you Dude. Steve Dude, yeah. So your whole yeah, life you're like the Dude? Yeah, like yeah, dude. pretty much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been called some other things, but not I'm for sure. a family show, you know? <laughs> Let me ask you a question. We do a really bad English accent. Can you do a really bad uh, American accent? Well, I'll tell you I can because uh, we were talking about uh, Richie Smith at yeah. his funeral. I was there in my London Fire Brigade uniform with my Cockney, Cockney accent, and my Cockney accent is so strong, they thought I was from Brooklyn, and some guy from yeah. Long Island come up with, hey, what's this, London Fire Brigade? I thought you were from Brooklyn. <laughs> that's not bad. That's, that's not bad. bad. That's better, yeah, that's better yeah, than that's Austin Powers, isn't it? Yeah. Hey, come <laughs> on now, because I'm always watching the uh, Sopranos and everything. You know, we get a lot of we get a lot of US TV over here, so right. my kids could speak better American accents than they could British accents when they're five. They're walking around watching Mary Kate and Ashley and all of that. They go. talk better American than they do British. Right. Well, I see. I slapped it out of them. So what you <laughs> well, well, I hope you, know, you, hope you got good TV shows because you guys have been locked in your fucking houses for the last time. <laughs> what's, what's, really, what's really interesting here is that I did find the dude's uh, Proby picture. What? No, yeah, yeah, yeah. I dude. did. It, it, listen, it took me a little finish. bit of searching. He's panicking right now. And here he is. Who is it? Mary Poppins? Hello. Dude, what? what? Hey, dude, nice. Dude abides, man. Dude, <laughs> there he is, the dude. Uh, you have to shave the beard, though. Yeah, I've clipped the beard and I've taken <laughs> the hair off as well. Look, hmm. nice, brother. All right, all right. So tell us all about yourself before we dive into the blitz, the blitz creed, the blitz, the blitz. So yeah, I'm uh, I'm Steve Dudney. I was. Born and uh, brought up in East London, uh, just to the east of the city, the real inner city area known as the East End. There's a there's a soap, a big British soap called East Enders, based around life in that part of London. But mm -hmm. but that's where I brought up, and pretty much from when I was a kid, I wanted to uh, I wanted to be a fireman. And then we got on to in '77, I moved across the district and I lived next door to Poplar Fire Station, which was one of the busiest in LFB at the time, you know. And I used to chase fire engines on my push bike, like lots of kids. I'd chase around. There was all the derelict Docklands at the time, lots of uh, uh, derelict. For derelict, we say we say derelict, you say uh, vacants, you know. Okay. So <laughs> lots of vacant buildings, all the docks were vacant, vacant. So very busy fire station from when i was about 14 i used to go and visit the fire station and started riding the trucks there and then when i was 18 i applied to join lfb and two weeks before my 19th birthday in july 87 i got on the job on london fire brigade and i stayed there always pretty much well i spent some time at headquarters later on but always working around those busy East End fire stations. Nice. And I ended up uh, as borough commander for that actual borough that I grew up in. So I, wow. I, I had the, uh, That's cool. I was borough commander for the borough of Tower Hamlets, which is that East London borough. I was previously borough commander for Hackney, which is another very, uh, another borough just northeast of there. But yeah, and then I retired aged 50 on my 50th birthday, almost three years ago. Oh, good for you. Nice. So yeah. Are you on a flat call? right now? Are you on a flat? No, this is my uh, this is my study in my house. Oh, oh. what's a flat? Oh, so you live in a flat? No, no, no. no. A flat oh. is an apartment block. I live in oh. a house. He just oh, wants right. to stay flat. I know. I want to say flat in a flat, 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 flat. <laughs> oh. block of flats. Oh, you're in the flat, are you? Oh, you oh. Are you in a flat? Or Why don't you come flat? over to my flat? Why don't you come yeah. over to my flat? Maybe we'll yeah. do some flattening. I don't well, know. I'll meet you at the flat, all right? <laughs> my God. I'm so sorry. No, He's no, no, no. amateurs. My what do they goodness. call in, in uh, America here? It, well, in New York, they call it a buff. Everywhere else in the country, they call it whackers. What do they call it in uh, in, in England when you have Anorak. An anorak. An, an anorak? anorak? You know what an anorak is? Do you know yeah, what an anorak is? is? Yeah, it's a, it's a coat. So this goes back to your traditional Hanarak is a train spotter. People who uh -huh. stand on train platforms collecting train numbers, they're known as Hanaraks. Hey, because... Hold on a minute. Hold on. Is Steve speaking fucking English right now? <laughs> 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 I'm slow down. Slow down a little bit. Right. So what you've got 
Oh, what you oh, have? Please, Steve. Just speak oh, like a my. Oh, my. Don't slow down for this fucking guy. Well, yeah. <laughs> What's your anorak? Anorak. Yeah. Anorak, yeah. So well. it's for people who um, stand on yeah, people who stand on train platforms collecting train numbers, train spotters are known as anoraks. So anyone who therefore follows any particular um, any particular phrase, any particular trend, you know, whether it's fire engine spotting or plane spotting or whatever. Yeah, the word you use as buff, we use as anorak. So you have hmm. anoraks hanging around the firehouse? Yeah, not as much. It's not so. It's not such a big deal over in the UK. You know, it, it's a bit. You, you know, you you'll have a building burning and everyone's just walking past. No one takes no notice. So it's not so much of a big thing. It's pretty. It's more of a job than a way of life over here. And right. so, yeah, the the fire brigade are there because they have to be there. So you do have some real dedicated enthusiasts. Uh, some which I know are listening tonight because. I picked up some stuff on your uh, Facebook page today, but but you know those guys are great. You know, the, the, there's a lot of our because no one uh, LFB lost all their official photographers years ago, so hmm. a lot of our fireground uh, photography comes from these guys who you know they know I'm breaking balls. Uh, no, but same here. That's a same yeah, here. yeah. They're they're good guys, uh, uh, and uh, you know, th there's always a bit of piss taking. I get the piss taken out of me royally because I am I am an anorak without a shadow of a doubt. Anyone and no one would believe I would retire. I shot the whole London Fire Brigade because they said you'll be you'll stay till you die. But I did. I retired at fifty. I, you know, after Grenfell and the terror attacks and things mm -hmm. like that, and the plan around with the pension. It was just my time, <laughs> yeah, my yeah, time yeah, to yeah. take the you pension know when it's and go. Yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and it was a good job. Um, but it's changing, and you you have enough. You 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 see enough. You do enough, and you know. And I just thought. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready. I'm good to go. Yeah, yeah, I'm good to go. Is the uh, is the kitchen table the same? You know, as it is by us, is it the same? Yeah, yeah, the mess, the mess. So it, that's a naval term. So UK firefighting is based very, very much. Everyone was recruited from the Royal Navy um, back in the day. Um, so you've got the mess room. Um, therefore, that that translates across. You've got. Um, where you have a mess room in the in the on ships in the navy, right? Then we call the kitchen the mess room. So everyone sits around the mess table and talks uh, and abuses uh, and, and talks and jokes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know that, for the yeah, culture. and that 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 culture that culture has changed um, <clears throat> quite a lot in the last few years. And some of that was was a little a little. You know, the world's a changing place. We accept that, guys. Now we're in our fifties, we accept that the world's a different place now. Um, but you know, it 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 thrived on that. Absolutely thrived on that. You know, debriefed. You debriefed there. You laughed and cried there, and you planned weddings and you remodeled someone's house and you fixed a car. It all started off around the around that mess table. So yeah, it, it's a very familiar term. And obviously, I've spent quite a lot of time uh, over in over in New York with FDNY. And yeah, it, it's very much, very much the same. Apart from we have a, a shitty Greater London Council tables, we don't have that lovely, those lovely decorated kitchen tables you have. We just have a collection of shitty Greater London Council tables. <laughs> but it's the it's the same job, yeah, same thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know when uh, the kitchen table changed when you know those snowflakes like Pete came along and everybody's feelings yeah. got hurt. Yeah, <laughs> it's like yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. just a fact, man. Just a fact. I can talk about baseball though, and you can't. Just a fact, man. I don't even know what that means. But all yes, right. you do. Yes, no, you do. I don't. Oh, I don't know, know what you're talking oh, about. Oh, you know what I'm talking about. I right, get on your keyboard and play just a fact already. Will you? <laughs> just a fact, man. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> do something, would you? Uh, Produce, and, will you? Wrong. and he did the, did wrong, the wrong thing. thing. Yeah. Uh, all right, so let's get into the blitz. All right, so we got the. A real professional here. We just research, but this guy lives it over there. So yeah. basically began, uh, we said before, September 7th, 1940, right? Correct? Yeah. 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 And you guys have been at war already for uh, just about a year? Yeah. So they've been fighting the war. Um, you know, the threat of invasion to the UK was always ever present. But, you know, we, our soldiers and sailors and airmen had been fighting the war for a year already over in over in Europe. Um, and we had the Battle of Britain, which sort of just came just before, you know, the, the, the fight for air superiority over the English Channel was going on 
just before the Blitz started. Uh, and the, I think the idea of the Blitz <clears throat> was to try and eliminate the uh, the Royal Air Force and um, just completely um, depress and demoralise <laughs> the British public. Right. Right. Little well, did they know. We, <laughs> yeah. Well, do we want to do we want to watch a little clip first to sort of set the scene? Yeah, uh, I think that's good, Petey. I think. Yeah, what do you think, Coops? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You good with that? Oh yeah. All right, guys. Here we go. Stand by, everybody. In London, Saturday, September the seventh, nineteen forty, was an idyllic late summer's day. As temperatures soared into the nineties. Across the capital, people were out making the most of the unseasonably hot weather. By then, Britain had been at war with Germany for just over a year. But on that beautiful day, war was the last thing on anyone's mind. However, across the Channel, the final preparations were being made for the biggest attack against Britain since the launch of the Spanish Armada. By 4 p.m., nearly 1,000 German planes were crossing <coughs> the Channel in a formation 20 miles wide filling 800 square miles of sky. Their target, wow. the heart of London. For those blissfully enjoying the sunshine, the war was about to hit home. September 7th, 1940 is a date that will live with me for all time. All hell was let loose. For over nine hours, the people of London experienced for the first time the full terror of a concentrated bombing raid, <coughs> as hundreds of tons of high explosive and incendiary bombs rained down upon their city. The whole area was shaking, shaking. Bang, bang, bang came the bombs. We thought, oh God, will it ever stop? We were certain we were going to get killed that particular night. Over 650 people were killed as a result of the bombing. More than 130 of them, children. Oof. Wow. So just just I'll do a quick thing here. I have one <coughs> on the bombs. Um, so four fifths of all the bombs dropped during the blitz were high explosives. The German war machine constructed them out of thin steel to maximize the effect of the blast, and they varied greatly in size. Some had a cardboard tube, like an organ pipe attached, which emanated an eerie whistle sound as the bomb plunged to earth. Uh, they were expressly designed to terrify the civilian population. The smallest and most common were 110-pound bombs. They were also There were also 2,200-pound bombs, nicknamed Herman, named after the portly Herman Goring. Then there were Satan 4,000 pound bombs and the largest bomb dropped on Britain was the Max, weighed 5,500 pounds. The parachute bombs were very effective as they floated down and did not penetrate the ground. The damage they caused was widespread, designed to smash through modern pre-stressed concrete industrial buildings in residential areas. The author of London at War 1939 to 1945 pointed out as soon as one was seen falling, people would begin to move towards it, perhaps because they mistook the mine for a descending German pilot who seemed who needed to be uh, lynched or apprehended. Could you Just believe they, that? Shit? Have his ass beat. <laughs> yeah. More probably because they wanted the, sil the silk of the parachute to make skirts and dresses. This is what the guy wrote in his thing. This is the last paragraph. Incendiary bombs were small, but they were very dangerous as they could start fierce fires where they fell and this day were extinguished swiftly with sand or water. Uh, thermite magnesium incendiaries were about 18 inches long and only weighed two pounds each. So thousands could be carried by a single plane. That's crazy, Jeez. man. Yep. When ignited by a small <clears throat> impact fuse, the magnesium alloy would burn for 10 minutes as a temperature at, at, at a temperature that, that would melt steel. So that's, uh, I mean, imagine those little suckers coming down. I mean, yeah, no matter where they went. You had combination attacks. So you would have some planes carrying high X bombs uh, <clears throat> and they would blow buildings apart. And then it rained, um, it rained incendiary bombs, you know, 2,000, 3,000 per aircraft. And there was 500 <laughs> aircraft up there. So if half of them had incendiaries on, you can imagine that they would just fall in, you know, like snow. 
literally like like snowflakes and they would get lodged in rooftops they'd get you know go into open windows uh where the buildings had blown up and weren't on fire then they were going to be on fire minutes later with these with these things so it you know it was a, a very crazy, man. a wicked but yeah. effective tactic you know and, and and it was blitzkrieg is is um you know a fire fire bombing uh, war by fire so yeah but what was it why did they suspect that at all steve like they had no idea that that might be coming yeah yeah they did so all the preparations that were made were um, i think that, so in the first world war there were some limited um raids on london um bearing in mind we're talking about real slow old biplanes you know from the from the german air force back in world war one so london had, had seen um aerial bombardment 20 or so years earlier in world war one but the real lesson was the bombing of Madrid in 1938, um, and what that did, and that's where the um, basically the uh, an act of parliament come, the air raid precautions came out, and they started it because London Fire Brigade was much smaller than it is today at the time. You know, it covers uh, it covers the whole whole of London now, which is 600 square miles. <laughs> it was a much smaller fire brigade then, with uh, with just 62 fire stations. And they ended up recruiting um, 23,000 volunteer firemen. So there was 2,000 London firemen, and they brought in another 20,000. Uh, 20, and each fire station in London got six substations. So, you know, you, you multiplied the uh, the London Fire Brigade by, uh, by six. So you ended up with nearly 400 fire stations all in preparation, and that, that's when they had the phony war. Um, because nothing happened for that first year, a lot of younger, regular LFB guys left, I think 500 left to go and join the full armed forces. Um, a lot of the auxiliary <coughs> firefighters, some of which were conscientious objectors and didn't want to go to war, um, they were beginning to leave, or they were, they were beginning to get called war dodgers, um, uh, because they were basically sat in fire stations doing nothing. The regular guys were still going out to attend the regular fires. And occasionally, you know, it, you know, it, whenever you got a big fire, like a 20-pump fire, which is, say, like a fourth alarm fire, they might send some of these guys out. But generally, they, they were bystanders. So the, the preparation was there, but no one – but obviously when it, when it happened, um, the best laid plans and all that – it was because by bombs dropping, you've lost all of your water supplies, your roads are going, your communication channels are yeah. down. So everything, be, I mean, the the miracle of incident command, incident command as we know it, is a big thing. But they were just doing whatever they could because, the, I mean, communications was generally um, kids on motorbikes, 16, 17-year-olds running from the fire station to the fire ground to huh. send a message back to request assistance um yeah no wow. no radios at all you know there were a few wow a few wireless cars around but but uh, that was one said, night that so th th <laughs> that this was is one the first night. night yeah that yeah. was one night <clears throat> yeah it just took, the first how many night. months Corbs? how many months just it went just, from september to may so you know every almost every night eight months part. eight months right you said it's, yeah 50 yeah. set the first 57 days were consecutive so from 7th september to november the 3rd every single night and then they started um hitting other towns like sheffield manchester coventry so on and they started all the ports like liverpool southampton so yeah they started breaking it up a bit um, steve let, let, let me ask you this quick just hit my head like i'm, I'm trying to research world war ii just on the american side like all of the stuff uh you know, that the Americans did with, with Japan and, and Germany and all that stuff. I've been doing a lot of research. Like what was England doing? W were they just taking it? Like what were they, were they going after these guys in the air? Like, were they bringing it to Germany at that time? Like what, what were they doing? Like, it just seemed like they were just accepted the fact that they were just going to come over here and bomb the main city. Like, no, I think so. The, the real fear was a, a land invasion, which they'd done. They'd done everywhere else. Um, you know, ah, see, so that's good. Yeah, so they they didn't um, they never ever attempted a land invasion. I think the point was um, because of the small but very vicious fight that British military took to Europe. So the British military, after war was declared, the British military went in 
to Europe, and you know you've got things like um, Dunkirk where they, they right, got right, pushed right. pushed back and had to had to evacuate. That was just before the blitz, so they 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 they'd had a year. But I mean, thankfully, the the idea was that I don't think the Germans fancied um, a, an attack over Coming the in, sea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but they wanted it, and the idea was to to you know bomb the country into into submission but yeah so right. for in terms of the civilian population uh, they were at war um there was the home guard so all the old guys you know were in their 50s and 60s uh, like these like these old guys i'm looking at here <laughs> they become the home so you know you had local you had local <clears throat> villages and towns set up their own military units called the home guard because the young guys were over over fighting the war so yeah i mean there were there was no it was like as I understand it, because I've heard the stories from my parents and grandparents, it was like step over here if you dare. But but, but you know, and this this term, the uh, the Blitz spirit came out of of that era where you know, right. do what you want, and we're not gonna we're not gonna back down. Right, you know? right, right. And yeah. I'm sure the reality is it was a you know you listen to stories of people who were there. It, there was a lot of um, a lot of what was being said in the papers and on the radio talked about the Blitz spirit. The reality, of course, was much different. People were having a real miserable time of it, but yeah, yeah. they they survived it. They survived it, and then later on, when you guys uh, you guys brought brought the manpower mm -hmm. and the, and the machinery, and then you know the allies, and and then it, it was crushed in in the end ultimately. Well, you guys were at war for a while before the US. Oh, yeah, 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 for uh, yeah, two three years. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. So what was it saying? Uh, around two million homes were destroyed. Two million homes. Where were all these people displaced? Where were they living, Steve? Where Just all, all over the place. Where, where, where they could. You know, they were. There was a lot of. So, what, what really, what really fascinates me today is they'd blow. You know, they'd blow street after street. You know, block after block after block. They'd blow up. They'd have no water supply. They'd have no gas supply. But somehow or the other, it was always, almost, always reinstated by the next night. I don't know. In my mind, in my there's concept no way, right? of understanding yeah, no way. of like, you know, every you know, someone digs up the end of my road. They've they've got <laughs> they've got the road dug up for two weeks. So, you know, the effort and they had what they called prefabricated <clears throat> housing, which they were, um, and this wasn't instantaneous. But a lot of people were going to the uh, the welfare office for to get to get housing and get clothing, um, moving in with family. Then eventually on these bomb sites, they were building what they call prefabricated houses, which were literally sheds that were that were knocked up. Uh, and they lasted until the 80s. You know, some of them were, were still there in the 80s, you know, and then uh, eventually <coughs> because, yeah, right, you right, know, right. Um, land is so expensive in London. There right, they knock square. everything down. Yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, they, they, they were, there were so many people displaced. I heard, Steve, I heard that there were a lot of people were staying in the – I actually saw pictures where they were celebrating Christmas and stuff – in the subways, right? People yeah, would. That's right. Yeah, they would yeah, stay yeah. in the subway as as a uh, bomb Steve, shelter kind yeah, of thing, right? Yeah. At some at night. Yeah. So initially, that they the government didn't want to allow that, and people got locked out of the no subway shit. stations. Yeah, yeah. You were told that you were going to have uh, you were going to have certain public shelters were available. A lot of public shelters were built at street level. And of course, with a high explosive bomb, they were just killing people all over the place. Um, they, you had what you call an Anderson shelter. That was a tin hut that you stuck in your back garden. You dug out half the height of a tin hut. <laughs> you put that, and then the dirt that you dug out of the hole, you put, put on top it. of it. And that was an Anderson shelter. And Holy it was only Christ. really that there was such an outcry that eventually they, they had to relent. And let people live in the, uh, and I think that took a few months before they opened up all the underground stations, subway stations, right, right, and, right, right. and then people were were pretty much living in there overnight. Wow, your your mom, you said in the pre-show that you we had the picture that um, where where your mom grew up, that was your mom, correct? That you said? yeah, that's right, yeah, 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 yeah. So she she lived in uh she lived in Limehouse, which is a, a district uh, between. All of the Dockland. So there you go. There's a picture from the war. If you uh, so there's the River Thames and the and the famous U, the bend in the River Thames. So what you've got inside the red circle are the West India docks, um, and that uh, then in the blue circle you had the Surrey Commercial Docks, 
and in the green circle you had the London docks and the in between the three. So where that yellow circle is, that's where my mum lived, and that that yellow circle actually surrounds the church called St Anne's Church, which was used as the as the bomb shelter for. So just to the right of that church, you can see that that was the street my mum lived on. Um, very, very close to the docks. You know, she was less than, you know, a quarter so of a mile. The bombs from one basically to... falling all around there. Those were yeah, the main yeah, all, areas all... of that Germany that the Germans were looking at. Those those yeah. main circles that they were bombing. Yeah, well, it was it was indiscriminate, but they knew where the docks were, um, and they wanted to bomb all of the all, all of the wherever the, <clears throat> you know, the products of war were being made. You know, right, uh, right, right. Slow down that, right, right, right. Yeah, so down at the bottom in the blue circle, Surrey commercial docks were all the timber timber docks. So all of the wood that most of the UK was using was stored there. Um, a lot of a lot of the docks had food and other goods. So the idea was, um, but it wasn't pinpointed bombing. It was just indiscriminate bombing. And you know, we 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 did uh, you know we we did the same back. Um, you know, I'm not saying we were all victims because part of the although the the uh, Luftwaffe started it. Um, you know, we uh, we paid back with interest, um, and the bomb nice. in Dresden was, <clears throat> was, you know, shocking. You know, Dresden was bombed flat by the Allies, so you know it it was it was tragic. It was tragic in every, every way. Um, but but yeah, so that was yeah that was where she grew up, and she tells some amazing stories. Um, I think uh, the first morning, so the all clear went at five a.m., which was still dark. And she came out of the church, and bearing in mind she was eleven, she said it was a it was a crimson daylight. It, it, it was daylight. There was shadows on the ground. You know, you were cast in a shadow, and the smell. There was um there was ash falling like snow, um, and there was uh the sky and every so it was a it was a a crimson daylight. It was as bright as daylight from the fires, smoky. She only had to walk maybe fifty yards across to her house, but. She, uh, her eyes were walking, you know, wood smoke. We've all been there with wood smoke, haven't we? Yeah, uh, eyes were watering from the smoke. And she said the smells were, you know, a, a whole di all, all sorts of different smells, you know, from burning spices and you know, a sickly sweet smell from sugar burning. It was a uh, yeah, a, 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 an amazing, I, I mean, a shocking experience for a for a young girl, but but you know, she she's got, I mean, you know, she's 91 now, <clears throat> God bless her, and oh, she's. Bless her. Yeah, yeah. Good genes, kid. yeah, yeah. So she's a little, you know, she's a little slow on remembering. You know, you could have maybe but... worked till 70, you know what I mean? You could probably, yeah, yeah worked, I should have you know, done. Little... Yeah, <laughs> quitter. But yeah, <laughs> what the hell are you gonna uh, do for 40 years? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, oh, I'll ride a motorbike, so maybe that'll take care of it. Yeah. But you know, <laughs> she, um, yeah, she, she recalls that era with you know really vividly you, you know she, that's <clears throat> you know etched on her mind um and not in a not in a bad way either you know she's got a simple simple view of it she doesn't um you know we we say internationally we call them the greatest generation don't we um and that and her view of it is it is what it is it was what it was you know there's no we wow. went through it we dealt with it uh, she didn't see her, her dad uh some uh, maternal my maternal grandfather was in the uh, around about 1920 because everyone was so poor, you know, after the first world war, his dad told him to go in the Navy. So my, my maternal grandfather was a career Navy man. So he was away in away anyway. And he ended up, he, he came out of the Navy in 47 after 27 years in, in, as a career in there. But, but, you know, she didn't see, she saw her dad once every few years. And that's why between <clears> her and her siblings, there's like, Four years between them all, because that was when he came home off of leave and they did their thing. You know yeah, I mean? yeah. So you know, but <laughs> but they are so yeah. They are so that you know that that generation was so matter of fact about it. You know, they didn't talk. I mean, my dad went into the war a little bit later. He was younger, um, so he he was a little bit older than my mum. He went into the war aged eighteen in about forty three. Um. And yeah, he, he never really spoke about it. Uh, but there was no, yeah, he just it was it was what it was. <clears throat> yeah, great generation of so, people. So when, when these fires had to be burning for, if they were getting bombed fifty-seven straight days, they had to be just burning nonstop, right? I mean, 
were these guys working around the clock? What was it? Yeah. So when it started, they they were put on a forty eight on twenty eight a uh, twenty four off shift system. When it first started on September the seventh, seventh, the chief put everyone on permanent duty, and then I think it took a a, a, a week or ten days until they realised that that just wasn't sustainable. They wouldn't have a firefighting force if they kept doing that. Right. So they just worked uh, worked smarter, not harder, if you see, you know. So they reintroduced some time off for people to recover. But, but uh, you know, you read all the reports of the raids, and pretty much by daylight, by, by hook or by crook, uh, all of the fires were darkened down, as they say. You know, they were the, the, the fires were essentially quenched. Um, there was a big change, you know, that the, the, a lot of the early deaths <clears> were <throat> the regular LFB guys were trying to take a traditional approach to firefighting. Ah. And that was killing guys, you know. They were trying, bearing in mind the top of these warehouses on fire, and they're used to putting their escape ladders up and that and making an entry into those buildings to fight the fire. Well, they they were, of course, these fires were, were growing and growing. So... It, it became mm. there, there were two types of firefighter there was what they called um class b firefighters from the volunteers who could do internal firefighting and then the class b1 firefighters were the ones who stood in the street doing the firefighting and unfortunately uh, most of the pictures are the guys who were in the street but eventually the lfb men in particular who, who, who like i said were called the red riders because they still read their tradi road their traditional red fire engines they had to learn a new a new way of dealing things, standing outside and and just drowning these fires because you mm. couldn't uh, you just couldn't cope with it. It was just too risky, you know. And um, plenty of them are getting killed by bombs falling on them anyway. So you know, give yourself the best chance. How many did um, they lose total, Steve? Uh, uh, three twenty-seven. Three hundred twenty-seven yeah, guys. Wow. Three hundred twenty-seven. Yeah. Uh, and, then, and they were there were different days, you know. I think on the the night of the first raid, it wasn't too bad. Uh, what was the first? I have to remember my numbers here. Yeah, I think the first raid was there was nineteen killed on the on that's, the first that's night. That's just London, correct? Is what you're saying? Oh yeah, yeah, London, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Nationally, there were over a thousand. thousand yeah, yeah, over a I thousand. Have here, by wars and over a thousand men of the Britain's fire service. Yeah. Died in the line of duty, one third of them being from London. All right, so there you go. Yeah, yeah. In wow. addition, 24 women of the auxiliary <clears throat> fire service had also given their lives. 6,000 were seriously injured and many more slightly injured. Yeah, wow. yeah. yeah. That ain't no joke, man. They were talking here. I have this uh, to keep calm and carry on. That was the yeah, slogan, yeah. right? So, yeah. so we, you know, over here a few years ago, that was like a huge. T-shirt, right? Everybody yeah, that's right. And they came back. Yeah, that, that was that was the yeah. slogan from from Britain, right? From the yeah, from the Blitz. Yeah, that was that. Keep uh, calm that and thing. carry on. Yeah, the British people went about their jobs as best they could during the day, as there was a war on after all, and blah blah blah. It says here, by the end of October, thirteen thousand civilians would be dead, and, and you know, obviously more to come. The biggest raid uh, of the war <clears throat> was the night of December 29th, ninth, nineteen forty. The so-called uh, second great fire of London. You were talking about that in the pre-show, so I wanted to yeah. talk about that a little bit, right? You're saying yeah. there's a lot of stuff here, but th I, I, this was from I don't, I, you. You sent this to us, I think, uh, Steve. Right? Um, you are. This is what was written in one of these from a fireman's log or something like that. I think it's from Lee Lee Hutch. You are 36 hours into a 48 hour shift. The wartime demands have caused a different shift schedule. You now work 48, hour, 48 hours on, followed by 24 off, then rising again and repeat. Even your off time isn't really off. After all, it, it isn't like the Jerry's won't come over uh, for a brief respite. The bombs still fall, and sometimes you have no choice but to report back to the station, snatching what sleep you can in between alarms. Your station in the east end of London has escaped damage thus far, but manning the station in the midst of an air raid is terrifying. You can hear bombs falling all around you and hear the clang of shrapnel from anti-aircraft shells bouncing off the roof. Outside a helmet is a must. You risk you risk desk otherwise. When the alarm comes in, you jump on the engine just like in peacetime and head out the door, but this time your driver has to dodge shell craters and debris. 
All hope for a quiet night is shattered when the air raid sirens begin to wail around 6 p.m. Could you imagine that? Like, well, you, you know it's coming, really. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know uh, I, mean, I mean, when you hear that thing wailing, I mean, Chris I mean, you wake up in the morning, you, you you try to see what's what, who's alive, who's dead, and then by the time sun sunset, it's right? coming again. It's yeah, yeah, again. yeah. <clears throat> and you know, guys would sleep on the street. Um, in in those early days, they would they they would sleep where they were li literally you know you you read stories you know you read people's diaries of the time and, and they'd go back to the station and they'd have to do you know that that old heavy canvas hose that once it was wet and covered in debris it wouldn't roll up properly so that to go for a routine of rolling out and scrubbing the hose now don't forget the regular lfb guys <laughs> had spare uniform because that was a job a lot of these uh volunteers um had only one set of uniforms so they were taking off you know they were out scrubbing hose in their in their underwear while the uniform tried to dry and then they would uh, as some say they would fall where they stood and sleep for a while until the the <clears> evening and i think that's the point when they had to reintroduce because in those early days everyone was scheduled for continuous duty it was getting to the point that that people were ineffective, so they had to they had to introduce a day off. But as that guy there said, a day off. What's a day off? You've had yeah, two right. days going home and, of, I mean, of 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 endless still endless firefighting. Yeah, you're going to go home and do what? <laughs> yeah, you know, in our careers, we've all had nights where you you know I, I think we've all had nights where you you've been out in out in out in out all night, and I remember the. 2011 riots in london um the saturday night when they burnt they they burnt tottenham they they the riot went up uh, at one road in tottenham a district of north london where the riot started and we had a mile of buildings on fire and, and that was my blitz that night was my blitz because it was like the blitz i i loved the history and i remember getting off of a i got i escorted down with the fire truck started off at one end the riot was moving north but I remember saying in front of me, I had a mile of fire. It was a it was a, a mile long straight road, and the whole thing was on fire. And that was the only one night in my career I saw dozens and dozens of buildings on fire for as yeah. far as the eye could see. Wow! And, <clears throat> and that was an exhausting night. It was only one night, but do you that, know, do it, that fifty-seven nights in a row. <laughs> yeah, do that fifty-seven. So it's not like you're going from one job to another. We've all done that. Back in the day where you've had a night, you get back, you change out, you change your BA, you re replenish the truck, and then you pick up another job. We've all had jobs like that, but one whole night in my career where we were just trying to put out a mile of fire was, you know, I was exhausted. for, And, and that, that, that transpired to the Sunday and the Monday. By the time the riots shut down on the Wednesday, I don't think I was back to normal for another week yeah. after that. You yeah, know? yeah, 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 yeah. No doubt. Yeah, this so was can't their imagine life. These guys, right? Yeah. yeah, this was their life. This this was um, another point. I just wanted to say this because this one I have so many of these papers printed out, but this one caught my eye. <clears throat> so he says, around two a.m., you respond to a report of a direct hit on an air raid shelter. These calls are the worst. Bombs can keep kill people in many different ways. One of the most unusual is blast lung, which I never heard of where the victim's lungs are destroyed by the pressure caused by the high explosives. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You think of them as the lucky ones. They look as though they are asleep. You want to shake them and tell them to wake up and move along. Normally, high explosive blows people apart, arms, legs, all that stuff, right, brains? Yeah, yeah. He goes, and then there's the constant smell of roasted flesh, which never seems to leave your nose. Even on off days, you wake up and smell it. There are a few victims trapped. Despite the roar of nearby flames, the drone of... of that's another thing that I've read. The drone of German aircraft and the constant bark of anti-aircraft guns, you know, press into your eardrums. Um, you tap on Oh, oh that, that's what he was saying. You tap. Uh, he goes, when, when you're going into these collapses like we do, right? You tap on a yeah. pipe and yeah, hope for yeah, yeah. somebody to tap a pipe back, you know, finally. Yeah. Um, but he said here, the crew fighting a blaze one street over is caught. In the open, when a bomb explodes, three are killed outright and five more seriously injured. They are driven away to the hospital where another will die a few hours later. The city has fires merging together. As you direct a jet of water on, on a burning building, a wall collapses nearby, adding another fireman to the list of 14 that will die that night. Yeah. So this was, wow. I forget what this, this guy's name was, an extract from Lee 
Hutch's Tale, 24 Hours with the London Brigade, October wow. 1940. Incredible yeah. stuff, man. 14 yep. guys died that night. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Steve, did any any firehouses take direct hits? I'm sure, right? Um, yeah, yeah, there was plenty. Um, how many <laughs> how many were damaged at the end of it? Uh, I think, so bearing in mind you had 62 real fire stations and another 300, I think, over 80 sustained bomb damage, which was inevitable because you think... Oh, of my a, God. Yeah, you, you okay. think of a, of a fire station's area, you know, a, an inner city fire station, maybe they've got a mile or two square of their ground. Well, within that appeared another six small stations, normally in schools or, or car garages or places like that. So inevitably, you were going to you were gonna get it. So infamously... Um, Soho Fire Station, which still today, God bless Soho, we all bow down. Um, Soho Fire Station in central London. Who's dog? So that's my dog. I'm going to go up and choke it in Holy about two Christ. seconds. Yeah, I was going to say, that sounds like my dog. I was, <laughs> I'm glad it's not. Um, Soho Fire Station in London took a direct hit, uh, and infamously, they rebuilt part of it, and that stayed there till the 80s until they built the new station. But, um, where one of my stations, Poplar, which is the station near where I grew up, where that, that station, so that replaced two other stations in the 70s. And the location they built that fire station on happened to be a place where back in, and I think uh, you, you've got some photos of it to, to show you, there had been uh, there'd been a, a direct hit on a, on a building, which was right next to where the fire station now stands. Some firefighters were killed and injured there. Then another crew came to help them. The Pete, building... you have those pictures he's talking about? No. The fire station? Wake the up. Do you know the plaque that we put up? Oh, the fire but... station, I do have that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, they were, in the end, 15 guys were killed on the spot where Poplar Fire Station stands today. Yeah, and the in plaque, The plaque I have here. Yeah, in 2011, we, we, we put up a memorial plaque to those... Uh, to those guys, um, because we still do that, you know. As I was saying in the pre-show, we do a lot of. Uh, if if we find out where people died, then um, we will we will put. Uh, the, uh, the, now this was. It's uh, if you go go on, go a little two down from there. Two, not that one. Uh, okay. That's the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're the fifteen guys who were killed. Um, uh, uh, yeah, it doesn't read very well, but but let me have a look. Yeah, there you go. Uh, in the early hours of 10th September, the London Fire Brigade were attending calls throughout the East End, and at 03.40, the premises of S. Pierce Motor Engineers at 166 East India Dock Road, the fire station is now 168 East India Dock Road, Poplar, where the watch room and foyer of the existing Poplar Fire Station now stand, took a direct hit from a HE bomb, high explosive bomb. Crews attended the subsequent fire, which had spread to Woodstock Terrace, which is the next street down, and the Poplar Baths, which is the public swimming pool, to the other side. At 4.06, another HE bomb landed in the road outside where the first had come down, burying 15 firemen. By 10 o'clock, all, uh, all of the men's bodies had been recovered. None of them survived, and there's their, there's their names there. <clears throat> Yeah, and that was it. You know, that's just bad luck. Real, real bad luck. Yeah. Pete, do yeah. we have one of those uh, other videos that we were yeah, watching with the guy made that – he was talking about that, that grab that he made with the yeah. uh, scary ladder? That was yeah, pretty do we, cool. Do we want to do the grab first or do we want to yeah. intro uh... – no, What's the intro? I don't even well, know. Well, it was the one where he's just talking about just, what it was like yeah. to be on the fire brigade. Oh, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. do that one first. <clears throat> sec here. Uh, boom. Here we go. Among the fire crews that raced to the East End to tackle the inferno was 17-year-old junior fireman Richard Holsgrove. His team was sent to the Surrey Docks in Rotherhithe, where 200 acres of timber were burning out of control. Now the term was, the bells go down. And when the bells went down, we jumped into our boots and fire gear, ran out to the fire engines, and off we went to Surrey Docks. And when we got there, of course, I first had my first sight of what the fire was really like. This was the scene that greeted wow. him. There was wood burning, flames going up and everything. And I suppose inside, I, I don't know if that was frightened, but excitement as a young boy. 
I, I was more hoping that this fire be put out very quick so I'd get home and tell my mum. You know, it's all right. That was the feeling I had. The fires at Surrey Docks became the biggest Britain had ever known. A thousand pumps were used to try to control them and firefighters from as far away as Brighton, Birmingham and Bristol were called in to help. With little previous experience, Richard Holsgrove was grateful to receive advice from one of his senior officers. He sort of helped me by saying, all right, lad, don't worry, you just stand by me, but just hold on to the hose and whatever you do, don't let it go. Because you had something like about 40 to 60 pounds of pressure coming through that nozzle. And if you was to let that go, the hose would have been like a serpent. And if it hit you, it could kill you. Wow. How the hell did they keep the hydrants? Like, how, I mean, think about that, the water system. How the hell would they get They water? didn't. They, they lost them. Um, you know, so you had... Where, and that was where where the Luftwaffe got smart, is they would look at the tide. So generally speaking, they'd be drafting from the River Thames ah. or from the docks. You had fixed what you had fixed open water supply. So this was all the preparation for the blitz. And also you had they had in certain strategic areas, they had still water pipes that were above surface we're pumping so they were they were left empty but you could bring water in from outside because if they got smashed they were easy to replace but generally so at the start of the night they would rely on the fire hydrants mm -hmm. until the hydrants got smashed and the reason that the 29th of september raid was uh, december raid was so bad was because it was a big concentrated area of bombing so all of the hydrants were smashed and the Thames was at low tide. It was a, it was an extraordinary Holy low Christ. tide. So you had 50-foot mud banks that they tried to get. And in the end, they eventually, some of the trailer pumps that were towed to fires, they eventually threw them into the mud. And then when the tide started coming in, they just let them go. They Because then they were able to draft off of the, you know, nearer the, nearer the quayside. So, yeah, they, they generally, for the early part of the night, they had fire hydrants until they went, and that was it. You know, we, I mean, we, you can't, you can't even think about right what it oh. takes to, right? To, if if that was your only thing that you could do is draft water, like you would almost say to yourself, forget it. There's nothing yeah, 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 you could do. Yeah, yeah. It's almost you would give yeah. up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You can't get I, I, these things out with everything going. You yeah. know, what and I mean? that, and with, with everything working in your favor. Now you got everything working against you hey, all you, the you time. Better pay, you better pay attention at chauffeur school because they asked me how to draft. I'd be like, ah, nah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, and did they, have, you know, did they have a marine unit back then. So oh yeah, they had uh, lots of um, lots of fire, but so at the time there were crazy, four fireboat stations <laughs> along the Thames. As a result of the war, I think that went up to about fifteen. So you you had yeah pretty much everywhere along the river you had the fireboat stations because you had such a such a risk because all of the warehouse the word warehouse. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, wolves warehouse at Riverfront. That's a word we use in so Canary Wolf, which is that big, um, that great big high rise development near in what was West India Docks. It was came up in the 90s, um, like the World Financial Center. It, the guys who built the financial center opposite the World Trade Center, when they finished that, they came to London, they started Canary Wolf. Wolf is warehouse at Riverfront, that's what it stands for. Oh, really? So, yeah, that so you 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 know you've got all of these wolves in London, you know St Olave's wolf, Cinnamon wolf, uh, Canary wolf. Right. Uh, so that because you had such a big risk on the river, because not only did you have the actual docks, all of the riverside was which is now multi million pound converted warehouses, penthouses, those that survived the war and the those that survived being burnt down in the seventies. Uh, which isn't many, but you know a lot of them still stand in their multi-million pound buildings. But the whole of the riverfront was was trade, so you had to have quite a big fireboat, um, uh, you know, fireboat response anyway. And they had a dual role of firefighting and drafting water to to put up onto onto the land crews. But but like you said, you know, I mean, we've got a very poor water system in the UK in terms of you know I, I would I. 
give my right arm for one of your street hydrants because you've got <laughs> so much, you know, and, and right. you know, you know, uh, before I don't want to go off the subject, but when you I say, why do you guys use such little hose? We ain't got a choice. <laughs> you know, we don't have a choice because right. you literally we have to bring in hose laying trucks. If you want to pump water from a from a, a thirty six, uh, you know, a thirty six inch main, then you've got to lay half a mile of hose. You you, you know, you the the main outside my house is is probably a six inch water main. So wow. the minute you so you set up an aerial, <laughs> and you've got one aerial monitor going, you've got to bring in other water supplies. So bearing in mind they, you know, we take water supply for granted now. Um, not only did they have a poor water supply that that eighty years later still isn't isn't much better, but but you just can't. You know, you, you're right. Why? Did, how did they just carried on going? Because that's what I they, don't know how you could. They, yeah, like you could see how you would get. And then if you were tired, forget about it, if it was going on for a couple of weeks or months, you were tired. Yeah, you, I mean, yeah. it was just like you were shoveling shit against the tide. Like you couldn't get uh, out of your own way. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. but like you said, they just kept yeah. going, man. Holy yeah. Christ! And you guys want to see the uh, the story of the grab? Yeah, yeah that one guy I with the ladder. Steve, a question first. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I would imagine the weather conditions are much like New York, right? So you had a winter. So how much of a bearing did, did the cold winter have on, you know? These yeah. Fires? So we're we're a much more temperate climate. So we don't really get as hot as you in the summer, and we certainly don't get as cold as you. Okay. I mean, there was there was. Um, the December raid was a particularly cold spell. It was like like below freezing, um, below you know zero degrees Celsius. So thirty two Fahrenheit below that, what what we call freezing. But snowfall is you know we we, we had some snowfall this year. It was a, it was a big deal, you know. So we get snowfall every few years. So we never thankfully they never had to deal with um, yeah. never had to deal with snow. You know, you look at some of the winters you get. They are once once in once every two decades, we'll probably get a snowstorm like you guys get pretty much every couple of years. So oh, wow. that 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 was never an issue. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So Pete, pl uh, th play the uh, video, the grab. Yeah, this is a good one. Here we go. Uh, doo -doo -doo. And here it is. Over twenty firefighters were killed as firestorms erupted and buildings collapsed. But countless lives were saved by their courageous actions on that day. At Surrey Docks, Richard Holsgrove's senior officer thought he heard someone calling for help. And he says, there's someone up there, there's someone up that building. And I couldn't see anybody at the time, but next thing with there was, might have been a chair or something come through the glass when they just smashed it. And then chap shouting out help. It, it was three stories on there. We used what they call a hook ladder. And we used to hook it on the window ledge above us, climb up, put our legs over the window ledge, then lift the other ladder up, hook it over the next one. That's what we used. And he said to me, can you do that? Because I can't let go of the O's. I said, yeah, I'll do it. Despite his inexperience and the fact that the building might collapse at any moment, Richard climbed to the top and pulled the terrified man from the flames. He got over, I got behind him and helped him because he was all shaking. And we climbed down the ladder to the next windowsill. I said, now put your legs over the windowsill. Said, I'll hold you, don't worry. And I'd done the same, I looked the ladder, went down to the next floor until we got down the bottom and then helped the chap down. But he was, we had to treat him because he was, he was so shaken, he was, he, he was trembling, he was shaking all over. But that was the life saved that I felt very proud of. Bless him. Yeah. Wow. Scary, scary so, ladder, the, bro. He was a <laughs> seven, seventeen year old kid there, he was at the time when that happened. Yeah. And he's doing hook ladder rescue. So you call them Pompier ladders, do you? You know Pompier, the type yeah. of ladder. Yeah, yeah. Scary yeah. ladder. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hook yeah. ladders we call them. So he's going floor to floor to floor. Um, yeah, crazy. Crazy yeah. stuff. Seventeen years old. How's that? Yeah, man. Yeah, uh, he did Steve, we were to, we were talking in the pre-show too. Coops had brought it up, and uh, you know, how how are the guys, the young guys today? How how do they look at? Like, do they are they proud of the the tradition that the guys did? You know, the fire brigade did. You know, back in the war and and all that stuff. Do they do they is it brought up? Do they do they do a lot of stuff with that? 
Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, so it's passed down. Uh, and as I said before, so I was, you know, uh, as they say, uh, I, I was taught uh, my, my time coming up in the late 80s and early 90s, <laughs> I was taught my trade by guys who'd come on the job in the 60s, late 50s, early 60s. And they had been taught by these those blitz blitz uh, those blitz firemen. So you, you know there was a lot of uh, a lot of that gone. And you know it was our duty to pass that tradition on. Um, and of course, by the time the new kids were starting, you know, in my last few years in the job, you know, the, the, you know, there was kids coming on the job who, who are y- younger than my kids now and, and weren't even born when I joined. And and that's a reality. But you you instilled that in them. The, it's it's a big part of. It's a big part of our history, and London Fire Brigade, to their credit, bless them, have never forgotten that, and they'll always support anything to do with that. Our museum's very big, and and if you look, if you follow London Fire Brigade social media on their Instagram or that, they are always making reference to to the Blitz. So it's always it's very much there, and um and as I said earlier, we like we did at Poplar, we will do uh, if, if you find out about something then they will unveil a plaque in memory of those uh, in memory of those guys because so many have been lost over the over the years you know so many memories have been lost but someone will dig something out and someone will say you know what three firemen were killed there and you'll go someone will go and look in the archive and find their names and as in some cases as in that 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 one we did in back in 2004 um we were able to find the family. Um, the Association of Jewish Ex-Servicemen uh, got involved because there was a lot of um, a lot of Jewish in the East End at the time, a lot of Jewish immigrants in the East End. So a lot of those guys were were, were involved in the auxiliary fire service, and we managed to trace these this guy. Wow. And like I said, thankfully, wow. we the widow, God rest her, was ninety four years old at the time, back in <laughs> two thousand and four. And I think you got a picture of that. Have you of the widow? Uh, unveiling the memorial to her husband. Yeah, yeah I do. Here we go. Well, I, I, must think Mike, I think Mike Milner uh, leads that group, doesn't he? Mikey Miller. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mikey Milner. What's going on, Milner? What's going on, Mike? Yeah, hold on a second here. Uh, there it is. This is a great one. There yeah, you go. Man. Look at him. Yeah, there's... Wow. Uh, so, so that plaque went on the building? Is that what that that, that that plaque went on the building where that fire happened? So we unveiled it at the fire station. There's so that's uh that's her the 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 fireman's daughter and son in law who you never knew. Uh there's one of the uh the rabbis and me on the left uh looking very serious and interested. Oh, look at that guy. Whoa, oh, nice yeah. chops, dude. You got yeah. the yeah. chops yeah. working, bro. Yeah. yeah, when we were young, look, when I was clean shaven. But, <laughs> but yeah, you know, we, we were so glad to do that because, you know, that lady was very old and very frail. And, you know, we don't know what happened. You know, I assume, you know, she she must have passed some – I mean, that's 16 years ago, 17 years ago now. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. you know, she's obviously oh, but passed, it was good but, that you gave that to her. Yeah, it was good, bit. yeah. And like I said, we got that put on – building at the time and they've since um right written, knocked that building down and rebuilt a new building and just this year um the crews uh, my, my old crews are obviously those guys who are still there um rededicated the plaque and it went up on the new building so yeah there is a there's a great there's a great honor and respect for for the uh the sacrifices made uh and that's part of our, our heritage you know it's uh it, it, no it's, it is we yeah, actually just did that 288 when I was, was just uh, going to say that, Ruffy. Go ahead, yeah, go ahead, no, Coons. Can. Yeah, well, they, we found the. Uh, I don't. I think it was uh, Big Mike, right? From one. Yeah, it was Big Mike, the hazmat. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> his friend uh, owned the found, building. Owned the building in Maspeth, where uh, a Maspeth fire had a collapse, right? And we lost the soap. Uh, that was a soap factory. They lost about. <laughs> I, I forget what it was. Four or six guys there too. Yeah, and uh, nobody knew that that building was the site of where we lost guys. So we had a plaque ceremony. There was a big to do, right? We had a lot of companies. Yeah, we got there, the plaque like, made up. Yeah. We had the plaque made up. Now it's sitting on, I think it's an auto body shop now. It so. is an auto body shop and it's on the exterior of the building. And yep. uh, because those guys really never had, you know, it's kind of like a lot of guys died there. Got it. Yeah. And nobody really talks about that, that, that job. Yeah. I think that was in the fifties. Yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, Steve, I did want to. Uh, oh, go ahead, Pete. You uh, you know, uh, no, no, go ahead. Uh, I wanted to talk when when we get around to it. I want to talk about this photo, but let me just pull okay. that, and we'll talk about it in a bit. Let me just say. So, you know, is this something that was uh, learned during the Blitz? 
that they still use today, like, you know, something that they discovered or some fire tactics or something that, you know, they, they still use in, in, in fighting fires today? Yeah. So, well, I mean, the way the fires were fought, uh, as I said, was, was, a, was a change because <laughs> there was, you know, fires were always fought. 80% of our fires are fought internally today, and it was probably the same back in the day. And all of the firefighting pretty much had to become external because you weren't dealing with building fires. You were dealing with block fires or district fires. So, you know, you, you can only do so much. But as a result of the last raid, the last big raid on 10th of May, 41, when unusually they had to bring in more crews from out of London than ever, because none of the fittings were made, that that was where the National Fire Service was came from so after that raid in august 1941 they brought in the national fire service on the understanding that at the end of the war and it eventually happened in 1948 the national fire brigade was disbanded and it went back to local control but the thing is now although every different so you've got you've got about 50 fire brigades in the uk um, London being the, the biggest um, because it, it's uh, it's about the fourth biggest in the world now. Now that we got cut back, it used to be third after you guys, Tokyo, then you guys, then London. Now we've dropped behind LA after a series of station closures. But you've got big, but every area, every county, so there is no small single town fire brigade. So, you know, like you get on Long Island, you go, every town's got its own fire department and all of that. As a result of the nationalisation of the fire service, everyone was organised into big counties. So there is, even though you've got very quiet areas where they've got part-time firefighters, they are still run by a whole-time fire chief and they will have even one or two whole-time full career fire stations. And every piece of equipment, so you can bring a fire engine from the top of Scotland, take nice. it right down to the bottom of Cornwall, and all of the hose fits, you know, yeah, yeah, all yeah, of yeah, that yeah. standardization is what came out of it. Everything to do with breathing apparatus, the ladders generally. So everyone uses more or less the same version of the same ladder. So I can take, you can throw a ladder off of a truck and everyone will know the drill for that ladder. So that's what the Blitz brought about was a standardization. That, and, you know, everyone's got different versions and everything's got a different name and, you know, what they might call emergency tenders or, or tactical rescue unit in Manchester will be called a fire rescue unit in London, and that's a heavy rescue. But everything pretty much is to a, to a specification and the training and all of the drills. So I can join guys and do a, you know, a, do a, a, a drill, a training drill anywhere in the country and everyone understands. So the benefit of the Blitz, if anything were the lessons learned in terms of we can never find fire engines turning up and they can't even plug into a hydrant because their hydrant gear do doesn't fit our hydrant. So the good thing that came out of it, and I, I think I remember a story from 9-11. From there, there was a crew that came down into um, New York City from, 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 from upstate New York, and I think they picked up a job in the Bronx. I may be wrong. I heard the story off of someone like, uh, it might have been Chris Mandeville or someone told, told me the story, but but they yeah they they couldn't they couldn't um they couldn't they their gear didn't fit the hydrant so you know uh, and uh, and I don't know what came out of that and I know federal is a is a bit of a different word over over where you are but but certainly the big thing was that everyone speaks the same language and can talk and all of the equipment works you know and that that's the the big benefit of it is a nationalised, although they're independent city, metropolitan and county fire brigades, they do their own thing. They've got their own budget. They've all got their own plans and ways of doing things, but everyone speaks the same language. That's Excellent. Good. Yeah. Just right, to, uh, well, hold okay. on. Just to say, uh, Chief Cleahouse and a couple of the guys were talking, it was 1962, six firemen died in Mass, but so I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Hi, Petey, bring that picture back up. Yeah, so this is known as the greatest war photo ever taken. It's amazing. Yeah. Can, can, we, can we describe, for especially for the audio listeners, um, what's happening in this photo here? So it's taken by Herbert Morrison, who was a Daily Mail um, newspaper photographer. It was taken from west of... So I think it might have been 
from somewhere like the Savoy Hotel, somewhere, or it might have been the Daily Mail offices in Fleet Street because they're all fairly close by. But, yeah, it, it's basically a picture taken from about half a mile away of um, St Paul's Cathedral in, at the height of the 29th of December raid where Churchill famously said St Paul's Cathedral must survive. Um, yeah, and it's it's a picture of St Paul's Cathedral surrounded by flames and burning buildings. But, you know, that was probably one of the tall. We didn't have high-rise buildings in London back in the war, so that was probably the tallest, one of the tallest structures in London at, at 350 feet or, or, or so. And there you go, sticking sticking right out. Among and the, the goddamn crowds missed it. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> You're a crowd. Oh, right, yeah, right, they right, make right. Fan, yeah, they make fantastic cars, though. And good engineering. <laughs> it's all forgotten now. You did yeah, Steve, they, did that ahead. get hit? Did that no, ever get hit? It did, it did. Um, but they the worst was up in the top dome there. You see the dome at the top. Yep. There was a it – was, it was very lucky because uh, an incendiary device – pierced the roof and got caught in the rafters which would have probably destroyed but as it as the magnesium was burning it dislodged and fell down into hundreds of feet below into the main nave of the church so on the lower part of the roof um there so as well as the dome bit the cathedral that that dome is a centerpiece so the cathedral stretches out in, in almost a cross shape beneath that so there were a number of fires that the fire wardens who were part of the clergy and the choir boys and all that, they put out a number of fires on the roof, but the, the fire that could have burnt the cathedral down, luckily that, that fell from oh, down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Front, fell down and the fire in the rafters was, <laughs> wow. was put out. Yeah. Wow. And, and so as on this, so there was always a massive, if you ever get a call to a fire in St. Paul's cathedral, it, it, it's uh it's what we would call an FDNY response, meaning instead of the usual two or three trucks going, there's Everybody. about there's about ten trucks go on it. Um, and back in the day, whether it was legend or truth, but the uh, and this would, you know, it certainly wasn't written in procedures. But back in the day when we ever when we were taught about St Paul's Cathedral, they always expected that if there was a fire in St Paul's Cathedral, they would lose firefighters. <laughs> They'd never say that today, but but you know, it was a different world in the eighties, and they always thought that. That because the roof structure is so, you know, so full of timber, and, and and it would be an aggressive firefight because of the, the the uh the value to the country of the building. They always expected that that firefighters would die if it ever catch on fire. But it's still there today. So, <coughs> so yeah. uh, we used to say that roofy. Remember with the bingo hall? There used to be the old theater. Yeah. I, ain't, yeah. I ain't going in there. Somebody ain't coming out of there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any of those big domes, man? Uh, you yeah. know, it's always. Yeah, well, we're speaking of Winston Churchill. He used to call he had a name for them, right? Heroes with grimy faces is what he called the firefighters. Yeah, that, that's true. Yeah, that, that's the same. That, hey, like that, that little out. nugget I pulled down, Steve. Pulled that yeah. one out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, and there's some great pictures here of them fighting fires. And this one really gets me right here. Um, because you know, pulling out Bodies out of the rubble. It reminds me a lot of 9/11, and it's uh, <clears throat> it's traumatic to see. But this is this was the reality that they were dealing with every day. Yeah, and um, um, so I think um, this is. Uh, I knew the photo I was looking for. It is a well-known photo, and I can't remember the detail of it. I think. Don't quote me because there's probably someone in here who knows better. So, but I think the photo was taken in East London, I'm not certain, and I think it was part of the later raid. So after the Blitz had finished in 1941, then towards the end of the war, we had the V1 and the V2 attacks, which were effectively, the V1s were unpiloted bombs that were sent across from Germany, so there was no shooting them down. And what they would do, they would blow, they would blow streets apart instead of starting small fires. And I think this is a rescue from a V1 attack that wow. just blew down a street full of houses. And then, of oh. course, towards the end of the war, we had the V2, which was a rocket. So where the V2s landed, and there were 511 V2 attacks, oh, and they oh, took down Christ. yeah, they took down blocks at a time. You know, they were very, very high explosive um, yeah. 
rocket attacks. Yeah, we, so were, talking, our, we were talking about this in the uh, chat a little bit or pro earlier, and and uh, actually, it's those V one rockets that actually wound up getting us to the moon ultimately, because we uh, yeah yeah brought all the Germans over in Operation Paperclip, mm -hmm. and then they oh, uh, then they put us on the moon with those V one rocket. There's V that V rocket technology. Mm -hmm. Nuts. You know what uh, stands out to me? It's crazy. I didn't know that. Uh, Mo from the Three Stooges was a firefighter in, uh, in, in London. Mo's making a grab there, bro. Oh, God. Yeah. The English oh, like that hairstyle back then. I don't know what the hell's going on with that. The little feathers on the side. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> That's what I, I could have that. No, if I oh, if I weren't there, he is. Yeah, yeah but you know, yeah, but it's shit. You know, they, if got, I let this oh. side bit grow, I would have that. But yeah, you yeah, know, he's got like, the feathers working. Yeah, yeah man. Hey, Mo. Hold on, there he is. Oh my God! Yeah, most making a grab. It's worse. Hey, listen, that guy's in there. You know what? We don't have in this country, Coops. We don't have any anybody who would, you know, like think about if there was an attack on, like, consistently, like something like that in a war in the, in the states. You know what well, I mean? We'd be, like we'd be in deep shit with the snowflakes, bro. Are you kidding me? Holy nah, Christ! You know so we still have a great military, yeah. bro. But you know, it's it's the rest of the <clears> civilian <throat> population that will be running around like. Uh, you know, looking for their safe space. I'll tell you one thing, though, guys, and and I'm I not I don't necessarily disagree with you, but you everybody should read a book called Tribe by Sebastian Younger, and it's all about how communities change in wartime, and yeah. uh, the the studies are a little different than you'd think because what happens is that people wind up in these very stressful times. Let's take Bosnia or uh, you know other wars and other times that he goes through it all over and over and over. People wind up actually toughening up a lot of the and, and uh, man up the, the, a lot of the mental um, uh, issues of the society. They have no away. choice. Like schizophrenia goes away, goes to super low numbers. Um, you know, people wind up having to be able to deal with it. So never forget, hard times make hard it's men. hard people. Yeah, right? hard, yeah, and exactly, hard mm -hmm. men make good times. Good, good. Uh, you know, uh, good times make soft men. Soft men make bad times, and we're in that cycle right now. Hmm. Bad times. Look at that, Pete coming out a little confused. He came out, actually, I was going to tell him, "Wow, it's three minutes. I'm never going to get back for my life." But that was actually pretty good. That was actually good. That would be. <laughs> well, Bravo. it's a really good book. Kudos. Just definitely read that book. Kudos. Oh, all right, Steve. Do you have anything else? I know what. Uh, what time is it over there? It's uh, three uh, in the morning or something quarter ridiculous. Quarter after two. <laughs> oh man, we gotta let you. Yeah, yeah, this guy's working hard. I, you know, can we just <clears throat> just real quick? He sent he sent some great photos of the fire service during that time. I just want to scroll through. We don't have to get an explanation. Just you know, a little description here. I mean, yeah. look at the bombed out buildings these guys are hosing down. Collapses had to be killing a lot of guys, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was nowhere to go. Where are you going to go yeah. to? Right. I mean, yeah. Uh, and they say you read some of the books. There's some good books written about the blitz um uh, you know written first hand accounts and and the, your uh, and as ridiculous as it was they a uh, uh, part of a building would fall down and they'd rest up against the side of a fire engine which would have just crushed like a bit it was it was a wooden framed metal panel but that's just human nature you shelter where you think you've got shelter don't you uh, and lo right. lots of guys died like that but mm. but yeah it, uh, and i think they you know they probably learned um, through hard lessons, how, how best to how best to deal with it um, as time went on, you know where to where to put the hoses. Maybe they had a fatalistic attitude. Who knows? Who knows? I like that the picture right below that, Petey. Um, cool. Yeah, yeah. I'll show that one too. I just wanted to show this one in terms of it's a little hard to see because it's black and white. But how much of the area around uh, it's flattened. Is, is flattened around the church here? Um, so it's it's really. Uh, I mean, imagine. Well, actually, I can't. I can't imagine this because in uh, '95, when I went to Croatia, it looked like this. So um, there was parts of the. You know, there were entire villages completely gone. But this yeah. is a city, man. So uh, here are some firefighters from the era, or these. Uh, yeah, yeah, they are. So you see the. Uh, so they're they are all uh, an AFS fireman because they had the steel helmets on. But you see. The guy in the back with the combed LFB helmet on the oh, yeah. the, the, yeah. the traditional fireman's helmet, yeah. So, 
yeah, there's your regular LFB guy in the background, and these uh, these are the uh, auxiliary fire service they've got on their tunic. Oh, there. I see it, the AFS, yeah, there. the yeah. AFS badge. Yeah, so yeah, you had those like regular London firemen, like the guy in the back who who had the uh, nice wool had... jacket. That'll keep you. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what, they uh... Christ. <laughs> That'll itch the shit out of you. <laughs> yeah, they. Stand, I, I wore those. Um, uh, let me see if I can. Let me see if I can get it. I mean, they look at the buttons on that thing. They still have that. Where's the camera gone? Look, there's my. Oh, let, me, one uh, of my... let me zoom out of here. Hold on one second. I see. I got. It, I got it. And if you want to, here, I'll zoom in on you here. Uh, let me bring it up a little. Yeah, we got there it. You go. You there got you that. Go. So look, that's when I joined in eight eighty seven, and we still had those coats. Look. Nice. nice yellow rubber yellow rubber trousers uh, super and cool. still had those coats until 89 when we changed over to nomex gear <laughs> crazy um here's another here's another uh, good one of the rigs and also uh the uh the motorcycles which uh someone was joking around uh, before in the chat saying oh ask steve who, uh, who was riding the motorcycle in that video clip that we showed, you know what I mean? You know, joking around that you're an old guy, but that's not yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but these these rigs here are uh, pretty interesting in and, of, in and of themselves. Yeah, uh, so from so from the left there, that is a, the, the open top one on the left is a regular red LFB fire engine. The turntable ladder, the ladder truck, by the look of it, it looks grey, so that would be an AFS truck an AFS ladder truck that was purchased for the war. And then as we go further to the right, these that they are two heavy pumps that were brought in as part of the war. So you can see they are that they are just built um ju just built so because they needed thousands of fire engines, you know, for the country, they wow. just mass produced all of these <laughs> Heavy pumps, and of course, uh, that so the the kids were riding the motorbikes. They are generally teenagers, sixteen, seventeen, who would be the dispatch riders. And I think in London at the beginning of the war, there's another picture of a taxi with a trailer pump. So they use London taxis to tow trailer pumps wow. to fires because they needed. Go, that's a heavy pump. Uh, that's wow, a, that's, that's a heavy. purpose built heavy. So that's basically a, a, a truck. With What's a, the one above that, Petey? Yep, for sure. Uh, That's a regular London fire engine. At the and time. look at what they've got on the back. The got the escape ladder, ladder yeah. Yeah. The escape uh, ladder. I, yeah, Nigel was uh, talking about those. And they, they, they were in, in London. They had the wheeled escape ladder. They last, last one went in 84. And one more, one or two more here, real quick. There's, go to sleep, these are the, the that's the morning. taxis. Yeah, that's the taxis. So they were regular London taxis. They, painted numbers on them they stuck a ladder on the roof they hitched up a trailer pump and that was a lot of the firefighting force in london holy shit and that's a control car so that would be like your chief's uh like ride kind of thing like a chief's vehicle yeah 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 pretty much yeah yeah right yeah. right got yeah. it got it uh, always uh, chiefs are always right was uh did chief steve do a ride along in this one i'm wondering if he uh <laughs> I don't is, know. You know, like did it do a little transcontinental no okay <laughs> oh good my stuff, man good really stuff. awesome stuff. and thank you for sending these photos uh steve these are really honestly those were choice amongst all the ones here i mean those are some of the most incredible ones i mean just the fire photos, you know what? I'm just going to roll through them while you guys finish up here. Well, you know what it was? He sent so much information. I mean, we couldn't even get to it. There was so much I printed out. This is only a, a yeah. quarter of it. Some story some that, that, came, that, that came from Nigel, a lot of that, yeah. too. Right. Nigel, yeah. Nigel also I mean, contributed for sure. I mean, where the hell do you start with this shit? Man? There's nowhere. <laughs> Look at this. I mean, imagine Boy. the South Bronx during 1977, but way, way worse. Yeah. I mean, like destroyed, really destroyed. Piles of rubble. Yeah, the this only is thing the is that we, we did it to ourselves. <laughs> right. <laughs> we burn our own houses down. No, I know. <laughs> um, this is, I mean, just nuts. Uh, the amount of that hose. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about firefighting as a way of life as opposed to a job um, for the time that these uh, gentlemen these guys were trying were to just it. stay alive, man. This yeah. wasn't. I mean, just really hit home, Ooh. Steve, what you were saying about oh, how oh, yeah. the guys had to adapt, you know, their tactics. You yeah. know, it was no more uh, just 
put some water on it and stop it from going to the next block really I yeah mean, that, that yeah it, it, it became about yeah. save saving an area and not saving the building you know uh, letting the building burn and using the you know protecting the the next oh, bit yes. of the street yeah. or, or or whatever yeah i can only imagine Good that stuff. these these guys were only going to the interiors if there was someone screaming for help other than that it's like goodbye yeah, so house fires generally that that would have been done that way, and like I said in the in the early days they would have gone for um, like a, a, a an in so we do still today we do what they call what you call a, a what we call a quick water attack. So as as the fire engine pulls up, you're off the side, and that twenty five that that um, hose reel, you know, I know Nigel was talking about it. That hose reel comes off. And that quick water attack was still that that comes from back in those days before they had any of the high pressure pumps that we've got today. Those guys were effectively <laughs> jumping off the truck with what wasn't much better than a garden hose, but getting in her, getting in early, getting in quick before breathing apparatus as well. You know these uh, the the proto breathing apparatus that you see in the photo now. You know they were incredibly complex to use. You know, oh, my whereas, God. Oh my, I'm just looking yeah, at that thing. Yeah. No yeah they, uh, so most of the time, these guys were smoke eaters because now everyone puts on, a, a, um, you know, a compressed air pack and you just change out the cylinder and like it's good to go again. I yeah, would go with that. Badass, badass. Yeah, so that, you know, and these they guys. Little clamps on the nose. Yeah, he's got too. his nose clamp on there. Yeah. Oh, my gosh, Crazy. man. This is so badass. I that, mean, that looks like a lot of effort to get into that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I don't even know what the hell it is. It's got canisters written all over it. I don't know. The fire photos, I, I mean, are some of the best we've had on this Put show. Um, I, look at this one down here. My God, check that out. Stretch in line over that mess. You don't even know what's going on. At least he's got his hat on, right? I mean, yeah, Christ. Yeah, yeah. This guy still has his hat on. That's an officer, yeah. That, that's a station officer, I think. Oh. Yeah. I mean, just... This guy's I'm, just walking to work. Look at this guy walking around with his umbrella. Yeah. So there's a fine British gentleman in a tailored suit walking yeah. past the street that's essentially the entire block is on fire. I mean, and then there's a few other gentlemen, it seems, looking at this... Uh, He's going for a spot of tea, I think. Uh, oh, God. Here, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. One more time. All, All right. right, last last photo, boys. But look at that. Look at this ladder working off the tower there, and then uh, these three guys... Uh, it looks like there's three streams? Yeah. Yeah, it's like, three yeah. There. yeah. 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 yeah I oh, think they're, they're from further down. I think this these group of three guys are on one jet um, or one stream, whatever you... I'm trying to read. There's just too many good photos yeah. to share, man. They're Honestly, brilliant, like, brilliant photos. It, it just, I can't, like, I, I would love to be able to, if you're listening to this on audio, you guys just go, tune into the YouTube because there are just far too many good photos to share. And I'm just trying to breeze through them all here because it would be a shame. Wow, there's a lot of pictures, man. I yeah. didn't realize you had so many pictures. 65 dude. total. Wow. Yeah, and um, it's all the you know, same thing too. It's just guys in the street shooting water into a built, oh, totally involved street. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the whole block, the whole, the whole block freaking block, people. man. And then if it's not that during the daylight hours, it's piles rubble. of rubble people. with with lines stretched over piles of rubble everywhere, mm. man. Crazy and, shit. And just yeah. So, you know, I, I don't even know what what to say, but I, you know, these guys are. These guys are the most incredible people. Yeah, I've somebody ever seen. in the chat, Petey said, maybe if you we'll throw them on uh, the Get Facebook. Salty uh, page, the the, the uh, fan page, for You'll sure. Post for post sure. them up on there so the guys can see them. Cool. That for looks sure, like man. A painting, man. That oh, that's look yeah. It looks like a painting. That's the other one that we saw yep. earlier, but a different kind of uh, cool. good stuff, man. I always wanted to learn inside, you know, info you. on that, yeah. you know. Yep. It's Great good job. To know all that. Very knowledgeable. Somebody said you're a very knowledgeable young man. I mean, he ain't that young. I don't know about that. I don't know about the young. That was very nice of them. Whoever said that. That's yeah. a great picture right there. Yeah. Patty Lee. Yeah. yeah. Wow, man. Tell the guy there's a, there's a crisp 50 coming his way. <laughs> there it is. Last hey, photo. This somebody so somebody cool. told me that today. He's like, you still got to get to the – we're on the fifth floor, baby. They all, you got to get to the elevator. It takes you to the fifth floor. When you get here, it's, it's yeah, good bro. stuff on the fifth floor, man. Yep. My God, guys! I just don't want to keep going know, up. You know, good work, yeah. everybody. That was some. That was some. Uh, some story. I mean, yeah. talk about it. I mean, really, it is firefighting as a way of life. It, it, that's just you know, way of survival. Yeah, survival. Yep. Steve, yep. appreciate you uh, 
taking the time, man. And uh, I know you got to get up uh, for work tomorrow. Yeah, gentlemen, it was been, Sorry, a, it's been an absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me on. <laughs> so and just uh, hang out with us, Steve. We're gonna we're gonna go back to the backstage at, yeah. uh, after we do our little spiel here. But uh, you know, thank you, you for any, coming. Uh, you got any shout outs, Ruffy? Uh, I don't. Well, I'm gonna be right. I'm leaving have... Wednesday. I'll be back on Friday. All right, we I don't have a show Thursday. It's Friday, and it's the show about nothing. How do you like that? I'm gonna yeah. sit here and do nothing but break your balls. How do you like that? <laughs> Work on the thumbnail. Oh, I have it already. It's in my. It, I have it already worked it's out in my be mind. A white page. No, 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 no. Nothing. I, I have it already worked out in my mind, All in right, my brain, me, and my head. Let me do my shout out. So today in the mail, I received something from the goat. The goat, uh, Chief Lafamina, sent me, Pete, and Lou with a handwritten note. These commemorative coins were made to sum up my career. I give them to the men who have worked with who I've worked who worked with me, and I respected. One is for you, one is for Lou. The third one is for Pete, because I know what an asset he is for the show. Respectfully, oh, Freddie. So he wow. had these challenge coins made up. Rescue Operations. Can you see it on this side? Oh, on yeah, this yeah. side, it says uh, Chief of Rescue Operations, Freddie Lafamina. Sock. Wow, Chief. man. Chief, I, 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 he is really nice, Chief. I really did, Chief. Uh, it's really a great honor that uh, we got these. I can't tell you. Appreciate Chief, it. thanks for thinking about me too, man. That's really unbelievable. Yeah. We appreciate you, sir. Yep. Uh, and another one we got from uh, B. Williams in Illinois. He's the guy that sent the shirt that you didn't know what he was talking about, Ruffy. Oh, right. He sent the uh, uh, hold the squad shirt. So <laughs> <laughs> never, never hold the squad. Hold the squad. <laughs> Let All the right, squad so loose. Let them loose, so baby. Mr. Williams, he also sent challenge coins for Petey. Thank you very much. Thank but you, guys. The chief, I'm going to put this note. I'm going to hang this note up, handwritten note from the goat. And there goes Petey's that were fell on the floor. All right. <laughs> <laughs> right that, point, that point is like Chief LaFamina. He can withstand anything, I'm sure. I'm not worried about it. All right. So uh, we'll see you uh, on Friday. Not Thursday. Friday for the show about nothing. It'll be fun because uh, we plan on getting toasted. So yep. we'll be yeah, we'll dr dr drunk and stupid. Anything Ooh. can happen. Who the hell knows? I'm going to think about it a little bit, but anything, who knows? Yeah. It's bourbon night for me. Oh, oh I might go with a little, uh, I don't know, maybe a little. Scotch. I'm going to go with the rye. I like the rye. Oh, yeah. rock and rye. All right. I'm getting hammered. That's what's going on. Good. All right, Petey. <laughs> All right, Petey. boys. Well, everyone, thank you for tuning in tonight. What a great show. Guys, if you're watching this right now, also know that you can find us on iTunes Podcast, Spotify, or wherever fine audio podcasts are found. Of course, <clears throat> when you're at youtube.com forward slash get salty experience, please take your little digit out and hit the like, subscribe, and share button. It Do tells it. We're almost at yeah, uh, thank you, Steve. Yeah. And it tells the YouTube algorithm you like us and you want to see more. And it really helps us get uh, the word out. Um uh, and in the comments Put the, I want to see Coops play the flute ball. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Yep. You're Fantastic. like the uh, song, songbird of your generation. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you, thank you. Also, oh, guys, head on over to Instagram where you'll find us at Salty Dog Inc., where Mr. Refreno is curating the finest fire photos in the game. Uh, maybe maybe you could do a few of the fire brigade here that we had in the I am. Uh, I'm going to take two of those I saw. I like it. Yeah. <clears throat> Incredible, right? Um, also, guys, uh, as always, head on over to GetInSaltyApparel.com where you'll find the coolest firefighter apparel and accessories in the game. There it is. Boom. I get in salty tumbler that I Boom. get toasted out of weekly. And guys, if you have a question for the show, shoot it on over to GetInSaltyExperience at gmail.com. Last but not least, guys, if you're on Facebook, uh, head on over to the Getting Salty fans page where you will find uh, not, not a page that we started, but a fan page that you guys started. And it is growing, growing in numbers. We have a, made a T-shirt for those guys, so that's fantastic. Love the Getting Salty fans page. Lots of great fire info on there, memes, funny stuff, uh, and a uh, good little splice of life there. Um Coobs, did you want to share your email, that other email, for the other topics? Uh, yeah, I'll be getting a shit ton of them, but I can't remember what the email is off the top I of my head. I got it right here. Oh, do it. 
Coop's podcast. Yeah, send it. Send pictures of your Gmail. rigs. Send pictures of you guys been at fires with your crew. And uh, we're going to start doing that, uh, I think, next week. We're going to put a whole bunch of shows together. They're going to be quick hitting, short, five to ten minutes. Bam. That's it. That's all I got. Oh, a new shirt came out. It's the uh, I fight fire, I drink beer, I know things shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. I'll have a picture for Friday. I, 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 I'm ill prepared. Well, we love that. Right. that and we're going to send Steve some swag. Steve oh, the yeah. dude. Dude. Steve dude. 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 Yeah. Yeah. All right, wankers. Wankers. All right, you, yeah, wankers. wankers. Yeah. All right, gentlemen. That's it. All right. Later. Stay low and go. All right. We'll see you at the big one. Thanks, Steve. Fantastic evening. Thanks, guys. I appreciate being asked. Cheers, brothers.